magical thinking is a phrase I learned when I was reading anthropology. Primitive cultures operate on magical thinking, if thinking. If we sacrifice the virgin, the rain will come back. If I keep his shoes. This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Our guest is the most extraordinary actress of our generation, and she's giving a stunning performance right now on Broadway in the Year of Magical Thinking. To introduce her, my co-host, Michael Weedle of the New York Post. I first saw Vanessa Redgrave in London in the 1980s in A Touch of the Poet, a performance I will never forget. I have since seen her give great performances in Vita in Virginia, a wonderful performance in Long Day's Journey into Night, for which she won the Tony Award. And she's on Broadway now in Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking, and that show brings her to us tonight. Welcome to Theatre Talk. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Susan. Um, did, you, did you know this book before uh, Scott Rudin, the producer, approached you about doing the play? Yes. You just read it on your own? Yeah. The book, of course, is Joan Didion's story. And there's a wonderful contrast between what well, our image of Joan Didion, the small, analytical, um, detached writer, and you, an actress of, you know, capable of titanic emotions. Scott Rudin told me he went to you specifically because he wanted to see you give a performance where you are reining in that um, volcanic emotion that she feels in the book. Is that something he brought up with you, and is it something that has sort of engaged you in doing this performance? No, no, he didn't ever bring up anything like that because mm -hmm. he's not the director. Whatever Scott said, and I'm sure they all had these discussions, yes. him and David <laughs> and Joan, and I've heard Joan, when I've been by her side, said she wanted me to play it because of intensity of emotions. Um, well, I'm, I'm playing the play. I'm playing her soul. I, think I'm like a violin and David and Joan are playing me. It's a Stradivarius, that violin, but... Uh... Well, it's kind of you <laughs> to say so. I might be a, a bit humbler than a Stradivarius, a sort of slightly lower thing, but <laughs> I don't know. But I think that this is a, one of the most enthralling pieces of dramatic writing I've ever read in my life amongst Euripides, mm. you know, Shakespeare. The reason I asked and you... And it is way out of the usual. And a lot of people think, oh, goodness me, this is extraordinary. But they can't get their heads quite round it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they want to categorize it. Mm. Yes, yes. And great writing, you can't okay. categorize. But they come in with a perception of and the And they book. don't know. But I had a wonderful letter from somebody. Yeah, well, you said, come in with a perception of the book. I had a little note from a, a member of the audience who had had someone very close to her die. She didn't say who it was, write who it was, but very close to her. And she'd only managed to read halfway through the book at the time mm. uh, because she couldn't take it on where she was at that moment. But she came to the play, which is obviously two years later, mm -hmm. at least, and thinking that she would be f going to find it very difficult, but wanting to. and her last little paragraph sentence said but I found myself laughing so much as w and I did cry too but I laughed so much and by the end I was at peace with myself I, so I thought I must tell you that because um, the dimension through which people who've lost and pretty well everybody has had someone die mm -hmm or grievously stricken, who's very close to them, related or friend or child. Um, that's an area that's been transmuted, not softened or become more remote, become more accessible mm. in a totally human way. Um, in this play. In this play. Mm. Accessible. And I think I'm just beginning to be where David and Joan were always aiming for. Because mm. we always knew that in death, as in life, in the midst of death, human beings to survive have to laugh mm. and do. Well, they have to live. 
you have, yes, but that, and that's part, laughing is part of being able to live. That's why those two categories, tragedy and comedy. Yeah. I, when I was a student I, at um, drama school, Jean Cocteau came to give us a little lecture and he was, of course, extremely amusing in that brilliant yeah. French way <laughs> of the intellectuals of the 1950s. Yeah. Not anymore, but <laughs> certainly yeah. at that time. And he said, comedy, you know what it is? It is we pirouette in front of the gods. And he said, tragedy is when we defy the gods. And I thought, oh, that's very brilliant. But actually, life is a mixture, and great playwriting mixes. In all the great plays of Shakespeare's, you'll notice that there are intense moments of great tragedy, loss, events, you name it. You'll always have some character come up who makes you laugh a lot. And I remember Arthur Miller when he wrote Playing for Time. It took my, my awfully uh, puritanical, constricted mind, mm -hmm. my mind mm -hmm. I'm talking about, um, I thought, laughing? Is it laughing? Making a jokes? How could you make jokes in Auschwitz? And then, bit by bit, as we went along, I realized that to survive, people have to laugh. That's how it is. That was an extraordinary uh, performance. There is hilarity even in hell. The amazing thing in your performance in the year of, of magical thinking is is the arc where, as you say, you're providing great sense of catharsis to the audience as you get to this very high emotional peak, all on your own, alone on that stage. How do you prepare every night? I know it's, these are sort of intangible things, but how do you prepare to pace yourself that way and then get to this extraordinary place? I, I work as I know musicians do. You practice every day. You practice your score, your text. Or it's like a musical score. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Both the, the uh, music of the soul and the structure of the text mm -hmm. and how David, with Joan, um, but obviously David's a director, has um, structured the inner and the outer and where the inner comes out and where the out disappears, mm -hmm. the exterior, the interior. And um, I know um, some people in the audience say they feel there are other people with me on stage, although there aren't. Mm. And of course, I feel that Mr. Dunn, Is there? the first yeah. way I refer to him mm -hmm. in the play, um, and Quintana, I feel the he's there, and Quintana's there, and the ambulance driver's there, and the neurologists are there, and but they're all connected. It touches off a lot of, but for the people in the audience, they also got their connections. Mm -hmm. it's, it's and you're studying it. You're studying the play again and again and again. Yeah, never stops. No. Mm. And that's why you say that you're just now getting because to... I've got to be free also to respond to the audience. This is not a fourth wall. Yeah. Um, it's never been a fourth wall, and David has always guided me, with Jones also supplementing what he said. This is not about acting a play in front of an audience, mm. by which he means I'm here to tell two or 750 people, all of them individuals, what happened mm. to me. That's what I'm here to tell you. I say at the very beginning in uh, what's like almost a, a prologue in a Greek play, mm -hmm. which outlines a situation. And um, so I'm talking to the audience all the time. I wanted to ask you about the performance in this play because it's been commented on that for much of the play, you, you are very still. I mean, much of the play is done, you're just sitting in a chair and not moving except for the blazing intensity of your eyes which a number of critics and audience members I know say you know those eyes those eyes are you aware of the effect that your eyes are having on uh, the audience out there is that part of the the technique of what you're doing no <laughs> but uh, what I am aware of and is part of the technique because we practiced it in rehearsals David set up chairs over to the left approximately where the far left front rows would be 
and the far right front rows would be, and to make sure that I looked specifically. And um, of course, he was sitting in front of me, mm -hmm. and I would often look directly into his eyes. And then he got the stage management to uh, blow up some cartoons of faces and stick them on the chairs. Really? And um, so that he could physically help me train to be specific in my looks, hmm. not just to look out front and get lost yeah. behind my own self. When you're actually performing it. Well, that's a training. That's like when you dance. You have to go through certain exercises right. to get into the right area of communication. Right. And but in this case, direct communication. Now, Brian Dennehy, um, I talked to him about um, working with you in uh, Long Day's Journey tonight, and he said it was mm -hmm. the most exciting experience he's ever had on stage. And he said it was because he never knew what you were going to do each night in that part, that you changed it, it was different every night, and he said it was running a race with her, and I just had to go in there and be prepared to go wherever she wanted to go. Is that a fair assessment of... Uh, uh, of, of how you approach well, it. Well, I don't know. It's fair if that's what he felt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if, of course it's fair. Do you do that to the But change? I didn't, um, didn't mean that I, he, what he meant was that a living person that was you were with creating, him. Yeah. I wasn't repeating the inflections, the looks. Of course I was doing the same moves. Mm. There was a but, famous <laughs> story, there was a famous story that you that you hit the younger actor, the on as part of your your part, that you it, it, it sort of you to shock him. Do you remember that? It's sort of uh, no, no, I don't remember that. I remember Brian saying to me because I'd hit a problem. I won't go into the problem, but anyway, there was a problem. I wanted to do something. Anyway, and he said he helped me out of the problem by saying, "Listen." Um, at that moment, you hit me, hit me, mm. hit me as hard as you can. Don't worry about hurting me. That's another way you can approach it. Mm. And of course, I was worried about hitting him on the chest. And I did pull my punches quite a bit. But he was right, because a woman at a certain moment of oh, yeah. complete frustration and panic yeah. hits out. Yeah. Um, he, but he did much more than that. Brian's a wonderful actor. I love his work, and acting with him was absolutely wonderful um, because he'd spend time talking to me about about Eugene O'Neill and how he felt about women mm. and talking about the different women in Eugene O'Neill's play and pointing out to me certain things about how Eugene had written about his mother, Mary Tyrone, who I was playing. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's just a fantastic fellow actor, and I love his work. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave is at the Booth Theatre in the Year of Magical Thinking for a while now. I think you're going to be yeah, with us in New York. Yeah, quite a while. I it's think. a great performance, and it's been a great well, pleasure having you on Theatre Talk. Sweet of you to have me here. You think I'm crazy? You think I'm crazy because otherwise I'm dangerous, radioactive. If I'm saying what happened to me could happen to you. You don't want to hear what I have to tell you. You want me to give you a good prognosis. I can't. So it's safer to think I'm crazy. So when we learned that one of our favorite radio personalities had a play off Broadway, our course was clear. And I'm so pleased that he's here all the way from Chicago with us now. Peter Sagal is the host of the terrific NPR quiz show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He's our guest tonight on Theatre Talk. And Peter, I have to say, you're not what I expected you right, to be. You must you get this all the time. Yes, I do. <laughs> what, what, let me just ask, what did, <clears throat> what did you expect? Taller, yeah. handsomer, yeah, well, younger. Sorry. I, think that's it. <laughs> I know, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> yes. There's somebody on the internet who once wrote, you know, oh, it's really a mistake to look up what your favorite public radio personalities look like. I, I image search Peter Sagal and I don't recommend it. Now, we should say you're not here to talk only about your radio show, but you're here to talk about a very fine play you, you have written called Denial yes. at the Metropolitan Theater downtown. Mm -hmm. That's about uh, an ACLU lawyer who takes on a Holocaust denier yes. as a client. Takes on as a client. Yes. Takes on as a client, Holocaust denier. Um, how did this play come about? Well, first of all, it's an older play. I wrote it in the early 90s, and it originally premiered at Long Wharf in the late 1995, around 
November 1995. And it, this is its New York debut, so, you know, the theater moves at a glacial pace. <laughs> uh, and the play began when I was a playwright in residence. Most people don't know this about me, but prior to getting into radio, which I did kind of accidentally in the manner of a man falling through a manhole, um, I was a playwright and screenwriter. That was my, that was my gig. And this was when I was a playwright in residence at the Playwright Center in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. home of such great writers at one time as August Wilson, Jeffrey Hatcher, Anthony Clairvaux. Come You're on a good there. writer, Jeffrey Oh, Hatcher, yes. Yeah. One of the best. Anyway, um, and I was hanging around. I was being paid to sit around and write. Not much, but still. And uh, I believe the, inspi the inspiring incident was a newspaper story about a black lawyer working for the ACLU who took on, uh, as a client again, uh, a member of the Klan in what was a pretty clear cut and dried free speech case. Mm -hmm. the, and people said, well, how is you as a black man can, can represent a member of the Ku Klux Klan? And he was like, well, it doesn't really matter who he is. The law is the law, and he's clearly on the right, and I will defend him because he's in the right, and he deserves to be defended. I mean, it really wasn't surprising to him. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting, potentially dramatic situation. And it was also the time, this was around 1993 now, when um, Schindler's List came out. Mm -hmm. So the Holocaust was much in the air, if you will. And I started thinking about that, and I started thinking about how much I knew about the Holocaust, how much it had been a central part of my Jewish education growing up, which is kind of weird, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if any other cultural tradition or religious tradition, so much attention is being paid to the greatest disaster in their history. I mean, it does seem to be particular to Jews in this regard. Maybe it's understandable, but still, kind of odd. And then, of course, finally, I got to the bizarre uh, and continually widespread phenomenon of Holocaust denial, i.e., uh, people who don't like Jews uh, trying to get back at the Jews by denying that the Holocaust happened. Now, again, when you unpack this, it's weird. Mm -hmm. If you hate black people, and there are people who do that, you don't go around saying that slavery never happened. You don't put on tweed jackets and put on ties and pretend to be academics and make this ridiculous theory. There are other, better, more offensive ways. There's no equivalent of David Irving there. No, no, no there is The British historian I mean, who was famously jailed for exactly denying the Holocaust right. exactly in, in right. Austria. Yeah. And yet, and that's true, you know, whatever other racism or, or uh, hatred you have, I mean, this does seem particular. People who hate Jews want to deny the Holocaust. That's where they think they can get us. That's where they think we're vulnerable. And of course, based on the reaction to this Holocaust denial, by people like David Irving or Arthur Butts yeah. um, <clears throat> or Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, <laughs> they're correct. This really makes Jews nuts. And ultimately, I ended up having this experience with a play, which is that you know Jews who are able to happily laugh off the most ridiculously, you know, anti-Semitism, like you know, just the most uh, strange, cartoonish people saying the things about Jewish conspiracies to control the media. They say, "Oh yes, we do." They say, ha, ha. <laughs> "We're having a bake sale to support the Jewish world conspiracy." Have you heard? You know, they, they, no problem. They laugh that off. Deny the Holocaust, and that same person will call for the death penalty for the person who did it. It really makes them mad. So I had all these questions. I had this question about this lawyer. I had this question. Uh, how, how and the lawyer, we should say, she's Jewish. Yes, the lawyer, of course, but she in my is a, version of the story. But she is a classic liberal ACLU lawyer who will say, you can you know, say that my grandparents deserve to go in the ovens. I will defend you, you for saying it. Exactly right. She's yeah. a classic you know, Voltaire. I'll defend until, the, right. until my death. You're right to say it. Despise right. what you say, blah, blah, blah. She's absolutely cut and dried. There's the law, and that is it. Right in the course of the play. Anyway, all of these things were swirling around, and I've always felt that uh, the best reason to write a play is if there's, or presumably do anything like that, is if there are some questions you don't know the answer to. Right. And there's a good way to find out. So I wondered what would propel a lawyer like that. I wondered what it was that propelled Holocaust deniers. I wondered what it was that made them so aggravating and dangerous and annoying and, and threatening to Jews and all these things. And the story came together. I have to say, though, this is a really a very interesting play, and you can't talk about the twists in the second act without giving too much away, so, so I, don't, I don't do that. Right. But well, when he peels off his head, you mean? Yeah, that head, yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> that's true. That, that's true. I, yeah. should, I, I shouldn't have mentioned yeah, yeah. Darn! <laughs> it's just I haven't <laughs> talked about my theater And that thing so comes long. out of his stomach. Oh, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> and I understand the special effects in this production <laughs> yeah, are I excellent. Mean, that's <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Whoa, God. But, that still shocks me, and I conceived that. But there is... And as I said, I don't want to give this away. There is an, another element in this play that I thought was absolutely fascinating in the second act. You have a character, sort of an Elie Wiesel type character, who is the spokesman for yes. 
the, well, the, 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 the six million. I should point out to say it is not Ilya Vassell. Oh, yeah, but it's not. Uh, there's a story about it. It could be Primo Levi. It could, could be. be the, the, yeah, basically, in the world of the play, this character occupies the same position in the universe that Eli Vassell does in the real world. He's a very well known survivor. Holocaust survivor, survivor, writer, right. uh, internationally known figure. But you bring up with this character this whole problem, though, of memory and embellishment mm -hmm. and creating the narrative. Yes. Um, as I say, I don't want to give it away. Don't. How did that come into being, though, when you began to think about... Well, you know, it's hard to say at this distance of writing the play, but one thing that I have always been fascinated with as a writer is the creation of identity. Um, a lot of my plays, and if I can look at them with some distance, because it's been a while since I wrote one, are about people who create identities, often through telling stories about themselves. For example, I wrote an early play, one of my first plays, a play called Most Wanted. It's a two-character play based on a story between an English professor at a university and a young woman who he meets. And the young woman may or may, it's never clear, may or may not be a prostitute, may or may not be an escort. But what happens between them is they come up with a kind of, if I may be so bold, Pinter-like exercise. In that's which bold. I know, that's bold. <laughs> Damn, that's bold. Did he just compare himself to Pinter? Yes, I think he did. <laughs> anyway, the anyway. PR people have I know. Egos. I know. It'd so. be more like Mamet, except there's not a lot of swears. Anyway, <laughs> in that play, this character creates this identity for herself, a story for herself, and they just sort of decide to pretend that they are who they say they are, who they're going to pretend to be. Always been fascinated by that. Mm -hmm. Here's somebody, the character in denial, who went through a terrible, terrible thing, an unimaginably terrible thing. And I read, I read a lot of Eli Vassell, and I read a lot of Primo Levi, who are sort of the two pole stars yep. of survivor narratives. There are many others. And what you see in those two pole stars are two, in my mind, different approaches to it. In one, the Eli Vassell approach, there is a driving narrative. There is a genius of art. There is, there's probably no better memoir, writ, memoir written of any subject than Knight. And his, for he survived by telling stories about it, by telling them coherently, by telling them brilliantly, by arriving at some moral sense that he then went on to the world. That is what makes Eva Vassell Eva Vassell, is that he drew these lessons and became this moral force through the power of the stories he told. Primo Levi, you read his stuff, you read Survival in Auschwitz, you read The Periodic Table, and what you see is a constant struggling to come up with something, to come up with an explanation. There's this key moment in Survival in Auschwitz by Primo Levi in which a German guard looks at, I think him, it might be another prisoner, but I think it's him, and the German guard says, you look for a why. There is no why. In other words, a denial, if you will, of any kind of rational narrative at all. Right. And that, I think, is the mysterious moment that we're referring to. That's what it's about. It's, a, it's the difference between a character who had to come up with a coherent narrative in order to survive, really. Right. Not a selfish motive, uh, a, 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 a self-preserving motive and a character who couldn't, a character who simply could not do that and has lived his life in wonderment at what the hell happened. Right. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, uh, I'm a big uh, admirer of Primo Levi's, too. It's, you know, Survival in Auschwitz, the original title is What is a Man? Right, which I think is... Different, yeah. di entirely different um, implication of that title than Survival in Auschwitz. Exactly, and there you have that question again, which is Primo Levi's thing. I want to ask you, why did you ever think that having the voice of Carl Castle on the home answering machine would be something that people would want? Whoa, shift gears! <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> these, are the, these are for the insider Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, here we go. Oh, yes. That's a amusing, segue into your radio amusing, career. Primo here. Levi, Carl Castle. <laughs> it's a, really, I think, either ends of a spectrum, don't you agree? Yeah, as much as Primo Levi struggled, I think, with the <laughs> lifelong questions of survival, uh, random luck, you know, virtue worth. Carl Castle struggles with diction <laughs> and how to do Britney Spears. Are you really going to, you serious? You yeah, I'm serious, the question? I'm okay. serious. Back to the radio show. This radio show now for almost 10 years, we've been giving away Carl Castle's voice in the home answering machine. Sure, I want it myself. Uh, of course you do, as a, as That's a right thinking here. person. <laughs> oh, you think. Uh, I'm sorry, there are FCC rules about this. <laughs> what happened was, is we were doing this quiz show. I wasn't even doing it at the time. I was still a playwright, screenwriter in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And they were like, um, Wow, what do we give away as a prize? We got no money. And then you start thinking of things like sets of encyclopedias and label pins and packages of Braunschweiger or whatever you have. And it's Collected like, works of Peter Sagal. Yeah, well, that would have been thin. <laughs> but, you know, they had nothing. So somebody had this idea, and I don't know who it was. Well, how about, you know, Carl? Carl Castle, of course. Beloved morning newscaster. As so, so many women come up to Carl and say, Carl, I wake up with you every morning. <laughs> Carl <laughs> loves it. 
<laughs> and uh, they said, well, just give, you know, he'll record a greeting in your home answering machine, and we'll do that for a while until we come up with a real prize. That was 10 years ago. Well, wait, wait, don't tell me. An NPR uh, airs here in New York. Uh, it, airs, it airs all over the country Saturday. different times in New York. I believe, don't, don't hold me to it, 1 p.m. Saturday on the AM signal, 11 a.m. Saturday, no, Sunday on the FM signal. Very good. And Denial, your terrific play, Thank you. is at the Metropolitan Theater here in New York running. I believe through May. I'm not certain. But, I'm, but I think the only 